Par le Lion d'Or du Festival de Venise qui sort au cinéma en France le 17 janvier. And thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you. Such a pleasure to have you here with us in Paris. This was the second time that you worked together with Yorgos. How do you compare to the first time? What were the main differences for you? This was actually our third time. We made a short film in between, but we, I think the difference was that we knew each other so much better, obviously. Um, he told me about this story and this idea right after we finished The Favorite, which was in 2017, and we made this at the end of 2021. So we had many years to kind of talk about all the aspects of the production of this, and we had by then been friends for many years, and um, so, yeah, it was, it was great. What do you like most about what you do? What's he like as a director? He's, I'm so, am I really loud? <laughs> no. Okay, okay, good. <laughs> um, he's very, uh, I don't, I, I think we just get along. We, we understand each other. We don't need to talk too much about things. He doesn't like to intellectualize, which is wonderful um, because I don't really either. It's very practical. It's, you know, whether it's the physicality or, you know, just certain beats and trying different things. Um, he's open to experimentation and also the material that he's drawn to, I really, really respond to. Um, so, yeah, it's just great. We're, we're really just gonna get along. And just a quick word before we open it up to the other journalists, tell us a bit about the rehearsal process, because that seems like that was a really fascinating part of this. Yeah, we, we had a rehearsal process that was similar on The Favorite and, and did it again here. And it's just three weeks to kind of play with the other actors. And it's a lot of games. Uh, Yorgos is kind of like a conductor and we do these, We you sort of get the, the language and the dialogue in your body without it being prescriptive. So you're not blocking out the scenes as they're gonna be done on the day. You're, you're just sort of like doing fun things and embarrassing yourself in front of each other. and. By the time you get on set, and this it was this way on the favorite as well, but but it was really really important here with all of the kind of you know uh, vulnerability of the story. You feel truly like a like a theater company. Like everybody sort of knows each other. They all know how Yorgos is. They all know, you know we all feel really comfortable and intimate with each other. So it was um, yeah. It's I love that part of the process. And fun, I bet. Really fun. Alors, qui, qui a une question juste ici, s'il vous plaît Alors, le microphone, à la fois. Bonjour, Sabine Mulderville. Hello. So, I would like to know, how did you work with the intimacy coordinator, you know, and with the director to prepare the sex scenes as in France? It's really a new job for us. So, if you can tell us. She, yes, I am, I feel so stupid because, like I said, I, I knew Yorgos so well, I, I felt so comfortable with the actors, I felt fine, and I was like, I don't think I'll need this, you know, it, it's fine, we're, we're going to choreograph these scenes, it's, it's very clinical when it comes to sex scenes, like it's, you know, it's uh, very planned out, and then... And Yorgo said to me, no, absolutely, of course we're having an intimacy coordinator, and this woman, Elle, is incredible. And I met her, and I was like, how did I ever think that we didn't need Elle? She was just, now I have such a deep appreciation for intimacy coordinators now, and I really was, I, I didn't know enough about it, and she was, First of all, she keeps the set extremely comfortable and very intimate, obviously, intimacy, but she also helps to choreograph these things and make it look more realistic while it's, when it's not actually happening. And, and to sort of, you know, I, there, she just makes the environment so much better for her being there. And um, yeah, no, it was wonderful. She was, she was amazing and, and it was, uh, I completely understand now why it is such an imperative and important job. Thanks. Thanks. Hi. Uh, what do you envy the most uh, uh, from Bella in that uh, uh, total freedom to live whenever she wants? Yeah. Um, her intellectual curiosity or uh, um, 
sexual freedom? I would say what I envy the most, which is also what I'm most inspired by in Bella, is her extreme hunger for life. And I think she lives in a space that finds everything past, past and, that finds everything fascinating. You know, she finds every aspect of life fascinating because she is in love with being alive. And so that I find very inspiring and I wish I could live like that more often, that whether it's an amazing experience or a really difficult one, they hold the same weight because that's life and that's interesting and it all leads to more evolution in you and it all leads to more growth and um, that nothing really has judgment on it for her. You know, like oh, this is really a bad thing to be experiencing. She just finds it all so interesting. Um, so yeah, I would say that. How did, how did you as an actor on the set, because when you're playing Belle, you're going from a baby to an adult, you know, and not shooting the film in order. How did you do that in your head, like keep all the different stages in place? Like, tell us about the background. We were, yeah, the uh, Tony's script had, you know, Tony's script was brilliant, so really, the dialogue and the way that her language develops was very much there, and so that was something to sort of, like, work with and try as we, as we went on, but, Yorgo and I did, um, a, I mean, quite a bit of working on the physicality, and we ended up staging it out, stages one through five, just so we had a sort of touchstone of different parts of her growth in case of shooting out of order, which we only really shot out of order in the very beginning of shooting, um, and then it was more chronological. But it was a lot of experimentation, because, you know, even with the, the sort of conceit that she is a woman with a baby's brain, that she is a baby. She also isn't, because she's fully grown in a healthy body. She's not forming her bones and her muscles and all the, and so her coordination is very different than I think it would be. So we, we felt like a more kind of robotic or staccato movement was more interesting than, and same with facial expressions, you know, like instead of being like a baby, you know, all the time, it was, it, it was more interesting to sort of have her be in a, a different space of her own kind of creation and invention. And so a lot of that was truly day to day and take to take, just trying things and then trusting that Blackfish, our editor, would, <laughs> would help to put it together. Yeah, exactly. Okay, Kia, then you can come just easy. Merci. Hello, my name is Antia from Notre Cinema. And so my question is, um, do you consider the movie as feminist as, I mean, it is a leading female character that emancipates herself from the men surrounding her and who tries to imprison her? And the end for me seems like a powerful vengeance against patriarchy embodied by the, by the Tory's husband. <laughs> so do you find it feminist? I find, I find it feminist. Me too. <laughs> you just gave a great answer. <laughs> I mean, that was awesome. <laughs> So why do you consider it feminine? I mean, everything, everything you just said. <laughs> Nothingness. No, I mean, that was, that was beautifully said. <laughs> was that part of the appeal for you? Why you wanted to make the movie? That feminist bent, if you want to call it that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, it, it, it's baked in. It's baked in that she, because of her, her level of agency and questioning the world and curiosity, I think that that's inherently feminist. And then, and then I think that I also just fell so in love with her as a person, like as a, as a being, um, that I just wanted to live in her, in her shoes or try to live up to her shoes for a while. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that was, that was perfect description. <laughs> Hello, my name is Natalie Shikarik from um, Many Little Cold Newspaper. Um, how did you embody Bella and how does she move, walk and change the way she stands? Uh, the way she stands, yeah. because she's more and more uh, not like erect. Her. <laughs> yeah, interesting. <laughs> um, again, it, it was it was just experimentation. It was a lot of play and invention. Um, you know, that was we were just sort of making it up because she's because it's not based on a true story. So I didn't have to do an impression of anybody. Um, yeah, it, it was just sort of seeing what what worked 
as we went along. I wish I had a more exciting answer for you, but it was, it was just trying things. <laughs> Talk, talking about play, the dance scene with Mark Ruffalo is yeah. so incredible. What about that in particular? Like, how did you guys go about coming up with that? That was that was one of the only things we properly rehearsed um, because we needed to the choreography. And and Constanza, who was our choreographer on uh, the favorite, the scene between Rachel Weisz and Joe Alwyn, where they're dancing, uh, she runs a company in Berlin. She came in and brought dancers <coughs> with her. And we started this sort of, you know, great exploratory kind of thing where it was, you know, how would Bella dance? How would she hold herself at this time period? Where is Duncan's jealousy? It was very much a scene, you know? Even though it's a dance, it's, it says a lot about their dynamic and her kind of freedom and his trying to sort of grab her and pull her into him and, you know, her power over him in, that, in those moments and you know, the, the struggle of it. Um, so we did rehearse that quite a lot, because then it goes into a stunt where you know, I kick a man in the balls and <laughs> throw a champagne at Duncan's face. So we worked on that one a lot, and that was really, really fun to shoot, because it had been a long build up to that. We shot that near the end of, near the, end of, of the film, so it had been months of you know, waiting, to, waiting to dance. And who has the microphone now? Another question? Oh, wow, okay, go ahead. Would you say that uh, Bella is your most difficult part until now? I would say that Bella is my most joyous part. And um, yeah, it was the, the things that were difficult about Bella were just my own self criticism or my own, you know, I'm trying to strip away my own sort of life experiences because she is so open. Um, but yeah, I, I would say she was the most joyous. Emma, you also produced the film. How does it work on the set? Like, how much are you able to step out of the actor role to kind of observe things from a producer role? Or did you feel like all of that was before the shoot, and once you started shooting, you could put that producer side aside and just focus on the acting? I mean, the, pro the producing part of it, once we were on set was really just conversations with with Yorgos and I like talking about what what things were going on and how things were unfolding and if there were any issues going on we would just talk kind of privately about it it wasn't really um like I felt like I needed to come in and you know I, I, I don't watch any monitors Yorgos just has a handheld so it's not like I'm I'm watching that back or what this needs to change you know he is he has a lot of a lot of creative control that is that is his and his alone. And so it was more supporting that sort of vision and talking a lot about Bella, you know, in, in the moment. And um, so yeah, I definitely didn't feel like I had to be of two minds. And now the microphone is just easy. Hey, um, the relationship Bella has with Dr. Baxter, played by William Dafoe, is very interesting. And I wanted to know what do you think of their relationship? It's it's a very complicated one, obviously. <laughs> um, you know, I think I think when I originally read it, I saw it as a, a sort of clinical. I saw Baxter as sort of a clinical part, strange, kind of cold. And what Willem brought to it was this sort of warmth that actually made it a more complicated relationship. And I think that's a good thing because. You know, a lot of the, the commentary throughout the film, I think, is men and their expectations of her and their relationship to her and what she, you know, the way that that is balanced out. So I do think that his sort of growing paternal love for her is surprising to him. She doesn't know any differently, but he tries so hard to remain cold and removed and you know, make her some, the, the, just a creature and not a human being, and realizes very quickly that he can't keep her, and that he can't, you know, he can't expect her to be that way, that she has something in her, and that's why it's so interesting in the end, when she returns and he says, you know, my surgery's yours, and she wanders the halls with a hammer and a song, and you, I watched you create Bella Baxter with wonder. That's not his doing, that's her. And he, his recognition of that, I think, provides him with a love that he never experienced in his life and that he didn't expect to. So 
I think that relationship's really beautiful, even though, you know, it's also fucked up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me put one say just easy. Go ahead. Hello. Hello. Um, the movie has a lot of uh, huge production design and VFX. What was the interactions uh, as a cast member on, on the set? Interacting with those the, those worlds? Yeah. Yeah, it, it, I mean, Shona Heath and, and James Price, the production designers, come from two very different worlds of design, and yours asked them to work together. Two people who didn't know each other, and they didn't know if that would work. And I think what they made is a masterpiece. It was, um, it was incredible because, you know, being in an entire in an entirely built world that was sort of Bella's version of the world, you know, through her eyes, and then getting to play Bella walking through Lisbon, you know, or or the ship, or all of these things that she's taking in, made my job very easy because there was so much detail everywhere, and it had all been thought through in this extremely, you know, creative, unique way. Um, it was amazing to interact with. I think all the actors felt that way. When you first walked into Lisbon, it took you 45 minutes to walk through it. There was a hotel, there were multiple <laughs> restaurants, there were alleyways, and, and that was all real. It was practical. It was the biggest set in Europe at the time. And so, I mean, it was just what, what they were able to kind of execute with the, from you know, the conception to the design, you know, the, the actual execution of it was just mind-blowing. And coming off the back of that, Bella also really comes alive through her costumes as, yeah. as it moves along. Were you involved in that process at all? Yeah. Uh, Holly Waddington, our costume designer, was, was you know, just is, is totally brilliant. Super detail-oriented as well. Um, it's no coincidence that Yorgos, the Mr. Details, loves detail-oriented people in these departments. Um, and. Yeah, we, we spoke at great length from the first, you know, sort of trying things on. I flew to Athens a few months before we went to Budapest for, for the shoot, and Holly came to Athens too, and Yorgos and Holly and I just tried on shapes and colors, just to see like what shapes worked, what colors worked, and then as we started building the costumes, we were talking about the whole arc of, you know, at the beginning, Bella's like, padded up in these, you know, Holly always says like she was wrapped in bubble wrap and Mrs. Prim is dressing her and then when she travels, she dresses herself and it's like, well, these are shorts so I know I'm supposed to wear something on the bottom and then I wear a hat because I'm traveling, you know? And, and then it becomes more structured and less color and, and more kind of mature as she evolves. And so the costumes, as beautiful as they were, were also so informative for Bella, because they really, they tell a huge story about where she is and her development. Okay, just ici encore, go ahead. Me again, sorry. <laughs> Hi. Uh, because of the, re the very special way um, Yorgos Lantimos is filming, does it mean for you, you should play differently than usual? Um, well, I hope there's no usual. Ah. That's my that's my fault if it feels like there's a usual. Um, yeah, no, I think every everything that you make um, is different. Hopefully, if you're doing your job correctly, and uh, yeah, so it just felt like this was the world. This was the you know these were the visuals and and the aspects of of her story and this story we were telling. So yeah, I know I don't know that it. That it feels different per se any more than it, than it usually should. On a juste le temps pour une dernière question, just one last question here. Hi, Emma, Hi. Um, If you have one word to describe the film, what would it be? One word? One word. One word? <laughs> yeah. It's a bit tricky. Oh my god! Go ahead. <laughs> um, Someone, throw out suggestions. What Come do you on. guys think? <laughs> 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 Anybody? Mr. Beast. Masterpiece. Masterpiece. Oh, <laughs> let's go with his. That's who we keep getting. Emma, thank you so much. We'll leave it there, ladies thank and gentlemen. Thank you so much. Emma's done. Thank, thank you. you.